Uh, If you would turn with me to John chapter 14, that's where we're going to work from today, more of the words of Jesus. You can flip there. Um, We're going to come in kind of in the middle of uh, Jesus' big final discourse in the book of John. And so um, if you haven't read through John, great book to read through, uh, this, where we come here is uh, Jesus has had the last supper with his disciples and we're kind of getting, the the way the book of John is structured is like you have this, uh, this third of the book, I think, or something, don't quote me on that. A third of the book is like kind of his whole ministry and then you have basically a third of the book is this last little bit before his death and then the, the other third is kind of the way the story plays out. And so a big, big section in the book of John is just Jesus in this last moments of teaching with his disciples. And a big part of this, very big part of this discourse is Jesus talking about the connection of his followers to the Father and the Son. He talks about the connection of the Father and the Son and how we are, are brought into that. And that's, I think this is huge in, in in our era, especially of church, where we're kind of coming out of church as like this very routine thing that we just need to, you know, we need to do this and we need to do this and we need to do this and that's what makes you a Christian. Uh, we need to know what it means to be united to Jesus. And uh, when you go through this passage and a, a lot of the New Testament, what you hear over and over and over again about our relationship to Jesus and what it means to be a Christian is not, here's what you need to do, okay? Okay. Contrary to popular belief, a lot of what the Bible teaches is not, here's what you need to do. These are a list of things you need to do. But that's a lot of the time how we approach Christianity. It's like, okay, I need to know what I can do, and then I'll live that way, and I'll look good, and God will like me, and we're good to go. Uh, But Jesus comes in and and actually says, really, you will do things. Yes, we can't deny that. There are things to do. But he says, it's not about, you know, here's a list of things to do. It's about Jesus doing things through us. It's about that connection to Jesus that we're going to see here and how that moves through us to transform the world. We are those who are carrying the life of Jesus. We are those who are carrying the truth of Jesus. We are those, as we've we've talked about, carrying the way of Jesus to the world through our lives. And so I'm going to give you a little spoiler of where we're going to go in this passage. This is what we're going to see. When we talk about living it out, we're going to see that every believer has the potential and the ability to see Jesus' power at work in our lives. Or we could put it a different way. Every believer has the potential and ability to live out the way of Jesus. All of us, by the Spirit of God, are brought into the same mission as Jesus. Okay, Jesus says, just as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. All of us are brought into the same mission as Jesus, and that is showing the world who Jesus is, showing the world who the Father is, as we talked about last week, by letting him live through us. So with all that, we're going to read uh, John 14, and we're starting in verse 12. Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father. You are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and reveal myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but it is the father who sent me. 
So much in this passage. You could do a whole series probably through this chapter, but we're going to look at a few things. And the first thing in the very beginning of this passage is a curious verse that I think gets interpreted all kinds of ways. In verse 12, Jesus says, you, the one who believes in me, will do the works I do. Jesus teaches us that those who believe in him will do the works that he does, will do great works. Uh, he says even greater than the works I've done. So I want to look at this and, and see a couple things. The first is, who is he speaking to? Okay, there's lots of passages in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where Jesus is speaking to his followers, and uh, it's kind of hard to know, is he just saying this to the disciples? Is he saying this to everyone? Well, here he makes it very clear. He says, those who believe in me, the one who believes in me. So Jesus here is talking about those who believe in him, who are going to do these great works, those who believe in Jesus. And when we read that, when we read in the, in the New Testament where Jesus talks about, okay, you have to you believe in me, he's not saying, here clearly, he's not saying you believe that Jesus is real. It's not like I believe Jesus is a real person, therefore I believe in Jesus. It's not, that's not the same, that's not, that's not what Jesus is talking about. It's also just not saying, well, Jesus is a good teacher. I believe that, you know, Jesus had some good things to say. It's not even just saying, well, I believe, you know, Jesus was from God and, and you know, there's Jesus who comes from God and there's, you know, there's uh, other religions with gods and, you know, they have a kind of this different way, but it goes to the same place. That's not what Jesus is talking about. When Jesus comes and he says, those who believe in me, he's saying to Jews, right? Remember, the audience is Jews, not just general, you know, world religions. He's saying, those who believe in me, those who believe I am the one, okay, this is said all over the Gospels, I am the one come from God. I am the one. They were waiting for uh, God to come and rescue them, to send a Messiah, and they had all these different ideas, but he's saying, those who believe in me, that is those who believe I am the one sent from God. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes it very clear that there's one way to God, and that's through him. And so when he says, those who believe in me, that's what he's talking about. Those who believe that he is the one sent of God. Those who believe that he is the king of the universe. And we could put it in the language we've been using. Those who believe in him are the ones who have decided to follow his way. Say, I'm going to follow your way. Those who, are, as we said last week, those who are yoked to him. That's who he's talking to. That's who believes in him. So who is this for? This is for those who believe in Jesus. And then he says, they will do the works I do. Now, it's really helpful when you read something like this to say, okay, he said works. That's a word that appears a lot. And you can, there's lots of apps and things you can do this. That you can click the verse One's called Blue Letter Bible if you want to do this. It really helps. You can click the verse, then you can click the word works, and it will bring up the Greek, and it will bring up everywhere that that word is used. And if you do that, and look in the book of John, it's used a lot, works. And when it's used of Jesus and his works, it's referring to what he came and did that showed who God was. So we see works referring to uh, various miracles, Various healings, when he turned water into wine, uh, a time when he had some supernatural insight into someone's life that he could kind of call something out. Uh, when he walked on water, which is defying the laws of physics. These are, these, all these things are described as works. And actually, there's very few things when it talks about Jesus doing works that aren't miraculous. Very few things in the book of John when it says his works that aren't miraculous. And so we look at that and we think, okay, is Jesus saying, you will do works, that we'll do everything he's done, that all of us will walk on water, all of us will uh, heal the blind or heal the crippled or uh, we'll turn water into wine at parties? Is he saying that we'll do all the works that Jesus will do? Or is it like, you know, you get some, I get some, um, you know, or, or I, we can c perform miracles on command? Is that what Jesus is saying? Well, for one thing, we're told elsewhere in the Bible that some people will have miracles and some people won't. So it's hard to say here that every single believer will do every single work that Jesus will do or has done. So I want to look at three key things in this, this little section, these couple verses. Three key things that help to understand what Jesus is saying here. One 
is that if we take this at face value, Jesus is saying powerful works will come from the lives of those who are followers of him. Powerful works, great works, he says, will come from uh, people who carry the life of Jesus. Now, does that mean they'll be m- more numerous? Does gr- when he says greater, does that mean they'll be more powerful? So, you know, like we look at Jesus' miracles and say like, okay, Jesus was this level, but his believers, his followers will be like next level miracles. Is that the only way to understand it? Or could we look at Jesus' miracles and see something that's in a way lesser than what's happening now? So Jesus, if you read through the Gospels, we've seen Jesus has these miracles. And Jesus has parables, which he also calls riddles. Uh, Jesus uh, multiplies bread for people, saying, I am the bread of life. And he, he does this miracle of multiplying things. And we see as you go through that there's this kind of interesting idea that Jesus has uh, really hidden things from people. The, the parables are called riddles, and Jesus says at one point, if you haven't read this, it's a bit kind of shocking, but Jesus says at one point, I use these riddles so that some don't understand them. And, and we see that the miracles, as we go, especially in the book of John, the miracles are like these little glimpses of the kingdom of God. When Jesus turns the water into wine, he's, he's showing uh, that there's this, this change in the the ritual, the change in the cleansing, the change in the substance of the new covenant. When we see the the bread, as I already said, the bread being multiplied, Jesus is the creator and the bread of life, the one who brings life. We see all these things that Jesus was drawing people in and it was pointing to almost in a shadowy way what's coming. And yet Jesus himself said it was veiled, it was hidden, some couldn't see, some couldn't hear. So when we look at that, Jesus' works In a way, don't stone me. In a way, his miracles were not complete. His miracles were not a a finished thing. Now, Jesus says, those who believe in me, they'll they'll bring something greater. And remember, this is in the context of of Jesus' works, which showed who God was, which showed who he was. And he says, now my followers are going to do something greater. And when I read that, I think maybe he's not saying greater in power or greater in number. Maybe it's not necessarily a miraculous thing at all. Now, I believe in miracles. I believe God still does miracles. I believe God still uses people to do miracles. But think about this. When we do works, whether we see them as miraculous or whether we see them as, you know, kind of normal good works, When we do good works that point to God, as he said, he says that, so the Father will be glorified. When we do good works, we are pointing and we are are bringing someone who's watching or who's observing or who we're doing the work for, we're bringing something complete. We're bringing something full. We now have a full story to give to people, right? Jesus was pointing and he said it was veiled and it was hidden and not everyone was getting it, but now our works come with a finished salvation. No more riddles. No more hiding anything. You know, Jesus was doing a lot of hiding. Like he did something and he said, okay, leave me alone. I'm getting away from the people, right? And, and now when we come, we have this finished work, the cross of Jesus Christ. And what did he say on the cross? It is finished. It is finished. We're bringing something that's full and final and there's no hiding and people can understand it, that Jesus died to rescue them. And so when we do works, whether they're great, powerful works or whether they're not, our good works are pointing to a finished salvation. And so when I look at this and I see the rest of Scripture and, you know, we do see a lot of miracles happen, but we do see a lot of ordinary works happen. And, uh, you know, we don't really see the same scope as what Jesus did, you know, we don't see every miracle of his replicated in, in, you know, in the book of Acts or anything like that. I think Jesus isn't saying, you know, every believer is going to do more and better than I did. I think he's saying we have something to offer that's finished and final. However, we do also see powerful things at work in the church. And that's key number two. Key number two is that, just like I said, Jesus says we will do great and powerful things. Okay, and so you look in the New Testament. For example, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. We'll throw up on the screen. Here's what we're told in the New Testament. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. 
So although I don't think this passage is saying every believer will do all the miracles Jesus did and more, what I do think we can take as a key from this is that every person can have the power of God at work in their lives. The Bible says this, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. And the context of this is gifts that manifest in ways that we can't really explain. He's saying, Paul's saying when he writes that, that every person, listen, you, if you believe in Jesus, you are included in this. The Spirit of God is in you. Then there will be some manifestation. And when you go through the things Paul is talking about here, there's some that seem pretty ordinary. There's some that seem pretty extraordinary. I would, I would say all of them are by the Spirit, so all of them are extraordinary in a certain way. But every single person has something powerful to offer for the kingdom of God, whether it's in this you know, setting of our family of believers to build up and encourage, or whether it's showing others who Jesus is. Every believer has some uh, aspect in their lives, the way they're made up, the way the Spirit manifests in their life. Every believer has something to offer in the kingdom of God. That's key. Jesus said it. Paul said it. We should believe it. The third key that we see here is that Jesus tells us to ask. Jesus tells us to ask. Right in this context, right? Sometimes we take this out of context, but right in this context when he's saying doing these works, when he's saying uh, showing people the Father, when he's talking about this connection and the connection living out in our lives, he says, whatever you ask, I will do so that the Father may be glorified. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. All right, we, we sometimes take that out and say, well, you know, this is just a general promise. Every, you know, everything I ask for will be answered. But in the context, Jesus is saying the, the manifestation of his life in us to draw others into Jesus, and he says, whatever you ask, I will do. So a key here is ask. We should be asking that Jesus would do powerful things in our lives to bring glory to God. So then we take all that and we say, okay, so isn't he, though, referring to miracles? Like, like, are miracles the main thing in this passage when he says works and greater works? Are miracles the main thing? Well, if we expand a little bit and look elsewhere, I think we can uh, find that you can have miracles without pointing to God or you can have things that aren't miracles that point to God. And uh, again, I believe there are miracles, but there's this passage in the Bible where um, Jesus says it'll be the end, and people will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, you know, in the end, they're trying to come into the kingdom of heaven, and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we, like, cast out demons in your name? Didn't we, uh, you know, we, we uh, healed the sick in your name? We prophesied in your name, and Jesus will say, I never knew you. Go away from me, lawbreakers, which is scary, right? We could pray for miracles. We could see miracles and yet not be living in the way of Jesus. And so I don't think we need to look at this and take miracles as the only place that this can play out. I, I think it's fully, it's fair to expect that God will do miracles. But I don't think we should say, well, this passage is just left only to miracles. I don't think that's the main thing here. I think here we're talking about uh, bringing the life of Jesus to others because he lives in us. And so, when we look at that, when we talk about miracles, when we talk about great works, another thing Jesus gives us here is that we, we shouldn't expect God to do these great works, these extra, extraordinary things, if we're not willing to walk in the ordinary things, right? We shouldn't expect uh, the, the great and powerful works if we're not willing to walk in the simple ways that he's given us. And that's where he's going to go next. We could put it another way. We shouldn't be asking for these specific things if we're not doing the general things. Look at verse 15 with me. If you love me, remember the same context here. If you love me, you will keep my commands. I will ask the Father, he'll give you another counselor to be with you forever. He's the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you in a little while. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live too. On that day, you will know I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. 
The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and reveal myself to him. So I want you to notice the flow of the text here. He says, you will do great works if you believe in him, even greater works. And then he says, and if you love me, you will obey my commands. There's a foundation to the actions. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. There's a foundation here, and the foundation is love. Okay, and, and Jesus says, for his followers, there will be this love, and this love will lead to obedience. And this, I believe, is underneath, as we see here, it's underneath the life of these works coming out. What's underneath is, is love for Jesus, which leads to obedience, which leads to these great works coming out. You see, we like the specifics, right? We, we like, you know, God, I want to see you heal someone. God, I want uh, to be able to prophesy and speak into people's life. I want to see these great and powerful works. And I believe God does that. But I believe those things are most often found in a life of love and obedience. Love and obedience are underneath doing these works, living this out. We Walk in the works that are written out for us, the Bible says. There's these works that are written out for our lives. We walk in those, and when we walk in the, the obedience, that's where we'll most often see these great works out of our lives. So in the context of the, his followers doing great works, he says there's this love that leads to commands. And just a side note, don't read that backwards. Right? He does not say, if you do my commands then you will love me. He says, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Don't read it backwards and think the commands is what accesses the love. Right? The love is what brings the commands and obedience. The love is what, what lets this come out of your life. It's not... You, you do these commands so you can like work your way up to love. Commands don't earn love. We do not work our way up to love by obeying. His love is in us, as we talked about, and it comes out in obedience to what he says. And then, very important, Jesus connects this closely by saying this whole section on him coming to us. And that's another very important thing for the life of believers. Okay, he, he, he talks about this, and then he says, and the Spirit is coming. So he says, those who love me will keep my commands, and the Spirit's coming. The Spirit's coming so that we can. It, we are totally dependent on the Spirit of God to live this life. So he, he says, he's going to come. He says, you will see me. He says, you, we will live in you. He says, you'll be in me. I'll be in you. He says it so many times that it's like this life when, when he makes this call, this love and this obedience, this is not Jesus calling and saying, okay, you better, you know, pull up your bootstraps because you're going to have to work hard to, like, be this level of follower of Jesus. He says, if you love me, you'll obey, and I'm sending the Spirit. I will come to you. We need to keep that connected, that, that if we want to walk in his way, it's the living presence of Jesus that will do that in us, not me mustering up enough strength to be a good person. All over the Bible, we see this. You know, we're told that, that we will bear fruit. Well, a couple weeks ago, we, we talked about love coming in and love going out. We could say now, his life in, his life out. And, and he says, I won't leave you alone. I'll be living through you. And sometimes we look at that. We, we think about, you know, oh, the life of Jesus, this this, you know, all these commands in the Bible, sometimes you, you just read through, you know, you, you pick a spot in a letter and it's like, oh, you know, do this and do this and, you know, don't do that. And, and we, we, we can get into this place where it's really daunting and we feel like, I can't do this. Anyone feel like that? I feel like that sometimes. I can't do this. I hear people say that all the time. And, and as I think about this, I tell myself, you know what, that is exactly why I feel held back. The attitude that I must muster up enough strength, enough spiritual passion to perform what God's desire, that, that is exactly what holds us back. That attitude of like, I just need to do better and do more, that holds us back. Because listen, in the Bible, we're called a lot of things. We're called vessels filled with treasure. 
We are called a branches that bear fruit because we're connected to a vine. We are called fields that bear fruit because the rain is poured on us. We're called a lot of things, and all of them are things that need to have something do something to it so that it can grow. It's never, you know, while you're a field, you just got to you just got to pop out those plants by, you know, effort. Or you're a branch and, you know, you got to just work hard to get those fruits out. And that's not how it works. We're always called something that needs a connection, that needs to be filled. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. What I see in this passage is that there will be great works fueled by love, and which is fueling obedience because I am coming to you and the Spirit will live in you. And so when we come to this next piece in our mission, and we say we want to share the love of Jesus, we want to learn his way, and we want to live it out. We want to live out his way. We need to not come to that and say, well, I'm going to do more and try harder and do better. I mean, discipline, of course, we talked about discipline when we talked about wisdom. That's not bad to say, you know, I'm going to do this and I want to do this. That's not bad at all. We need that too. But we can't let that be the foundation of our lives and say, that is why I'm going to live out the way of Jesus. We're told here it's by the Spirit. It's by the life of Jesus. And so that's what it means to live the way of Jesus. We learn his way, which is being filled with who he is, knowing his commands, knowing what his wisdom and his lifestyle and his pace looks like, what he delights in, what he promises, what his perspective is, all these things. We fill ourselves with learning his way. And as we do that, as we start to know what it looks like, what's going to happen is that fruit is going to come out of us. Okay, and you know, we like things that we can just, you know, insert here and take out here, and it's good. That's not the, the way of Jesus. That's not the way it works. It's not, you know, I'm just going to say, okay, doing this, and now my life's going to look like this. It's pouring in it's having the spirit of god in us and that's over time going to come out and bear fruit and so christian growth does not look like you know i've got the next level you know i'm carrying on i got the next level it, it often looks like a you know it's it's over time we're trending up but it, we're going to see you know going up and then oh con correction and going up and correction and, and we see this over time because it's bearing fruit it's letting his fruit come out of us that's what it means to live the way of Jesus. And when we start to know what it is, when we start to learn his way, then we take actions, right? We do these things, and he promises that we will see great things out of our lives, whether miraculous or not, but it comes from that foundation of love and obedience, living by his spirit. And so how do we do this? How do we get that balance of, well, I can't do it. It's the spirit in me bearing fruit, but I... I still have to act. How do we do that balance? It's hard, right? It's not easy to say, yes, it's my identity in Christ that's going to bear fruit, you know, but I don't just sit on the couch and wait for, you know, things to happen. God doesn't, you know, control my body. So how do we do that? Well, a few things I see in this passage and a few thoughts from elsewhere in the Bible. One, Jesus says very clearly, ask. Ask me, he says. You can ask God to show up and shine through your life. And so many times, and I don't know necessarily why, but so many times, when, you know, when, when I'm sitting down with someone and I say, hey, why don't you just ask God? They say, well, I can't ask God about that, can I? Yeah, <laughs> you can. If you want to see God do work in your life, ask him. Ask him to show up. Ask every day that God lead me into the areas where I can just bear fruit for you. Lead me into areas where there's good works that I can join you in. Ask, Jesus says. And a second way is as we learn the way of Jesus, we can take specific action. So I know I'm up here all the time saying like, it's Jesus, we don't need to just, you know, push and try harder. Yes, but we can take action, okay? Again, your performance is not like, you know, you've, you've done this many actions, so you're a good Christian. But we can still take actions. We can still, you know, spend time in the Bible and read something and say, oh, that doesn't happen in my life, but it could. I'm going to do that. And you can say, God, I'm going to do that next time in this situation. I'm going to, you know, it says, uh, don't let un unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Oh, I do let unwholesome talk come out of my mouth. I'm going to stop. I'm going to, 
I'm going to watch it next time, and you know, I'm going to make a swear jar. I, I don't know what it is. It could be anything, but we can, we can still look for specific action items and say, God, I'm going to do this at this time because I want to grow. And one final one, and this can be fun and tricky. I would invite us as a church to take more opportunities or take more actions where we are getting uncomfortable because of our faith. So a lot of times we pray, you know, and say, God, I want to see you do great things in my life. And then you're walking through the grocery store and you see someone, you know, kind of limping and you just think, oh, I should pray for them. And then you're like, no, I'm not doing that in the grocery store. Like, no way, that's so weird, right? But I would invite all of us, myself included, to act on things like that, right? And I hear people say, well, what if it's not from God? Is it a bad thing to do? Is it something you can do in faith, right? If we want to see God do more things among us, if we want to see more people uh, seeing the life of Jesus through us, then we're going to have to act on things where we think, you know, this could be the Spirit leading me. Right, and that's a, a funny journey, right? Because, you know, you probably do things where you're like, well, that was weird, and it didn't amount to anything. Right, that, that's probably going to happen. But if we're being bold in this way, you know, maybe it's just asking someone if they believe in God. Right, you're talking to someone, you know, you, I don't know, you're down at the beach or something, or, or in the winter, you're on the trail, and someone's kind of going the same speed as you, and you can do that awkward thing where you just don't talk. Or then you could say, you know, hey, how's it going? Are you from here? And, and Ask them if they believe in God. Like that, that's a very non-threatening question. They might just say, no, do you? I say, well, yeah, I do. Right? But, but if we do these things that are mildly uncomfortable, like, I don't know, maybe giving to someone when they don't even ask, right? All these little things we can do, it will help us to learn that we can just walk in these good things. And I, I, would be, I believe that if we do that, we will, see, we will hear powerful, powerful stories. And you know what? In the last couple of weeks, uh, I've talked to a few different people where I, I just hear powerful things that are happening around us, right? There was someone in our church who had an emergency prayer request this past week, and they sent it to me and to the prayer chain, and we prayed, and they got back to us and said it was amazing. They were in the hospital. They didn't know how long was left. It was like sudden, right? And there was, the doctors were like, we don't know how long left. And they got back to us, and they were like, we asked you to pray, and about 20 minutes later, it was like, it, it just turned around, and they went home. It, it was amazing, right? And, and you get those type of things, and it's like, wow, like God does these things, but we don't always act on those. I mean, that one's kind of easy, because someone asks you to pray, you pray. But we, as a church, if we want to live out the way of Jesus, and we're, we're taking in who he is, we can take these specific, a or these general actions, like we know what God calls us to in the Bible, we know what we're supposed to do, but we, we walk in those things, then we, we are boldly acting on those things that might be kind of uncomfortable. We will see God do powerful things. And so I'm going to invite our music team, um, and I just want to pray for this. Would you join me in praying? And, and if you're here or you're watching online and you're kind of like, this is getting a bit extreme for me, like, you know, I... This Jesus stuff, you know, I'm, I'm trying it out, but, you know, Jesus says he's the only way to God. What does that mean? Jesus says we'll do powerful things. What does that mean? I'd invite you just to ask. God is not threatened by your questions. Ask and say, God, I, I want to know more about you. Would you help me to learn and understand? And we are always here to talk. And just as I said at the beginning, this is promised to those who believe in Jesus. We will live powerful lives. We are free in Christ. We can have this identity of connection to him. Jesus is alive now, and he can live through us. And if you want that, I invite you to take that invitation because it's for you. So join me in praying. Father, there are things in Scripture we read, and sometimes we don't really think that they're happening now. It's easy to read that the life of Jesus is in us and not really experience much different than what we think ordinary life is. God, I pray that would change for those here. Pray that your church would really experience the life of Jesus and yield to his presence in us. God, I desire to see a, a people who are just bearing fruit for you. As we prayed before, you have said some people will bear a hundredfold for you. 
I pray that this church would be one of those hundredfold churches, that we would see people coming to you. We would see powerful things. We would see answers to prayer. We would see manifestations of your spirit, whether seemingly ordinary or extraordinary. I pray that we would just see your spirit at work. God, as we learn who you are, would that come out of our lives? Would we know your presence, know your love in us so that we can walk in the obedience you call us to, which isn't always easy. And as we do that, when we see these, these type of great works where people are pointed to you, where you are honored, and where people give their lives to you, would we be a people who lift high Jesus at our church? Would your name be lifted high in our community? Would they know your love and we would see people transformed. Thank you for doing what only you can do. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.